fear. Fear is one of those strange words. It's often misused in English because we use it in the same way we use other words, like love, or hate, or war. Because all these words can actually mean many different things, which are all distinct one from another, and yet we use it as sort of an umbrella term to encompass all of them. We have instinctual fear, situational fear, normal fear, irrational fear, worry, terror, horror. But the thing I find most fascinating about fear is that all types of fear share one common trait. I'm going to get this out of the way right off the bat here. I'm probably going to be gushing about this episode, as it is, in my opinion, one of the truly great episodes of Voyager. Sorry. But as I have mentioned before, Season 2 was certainly something of a grab bag of episodes. It's actually funny because when this episode came out, it was the second least watched episode of Season 2, at least according to Nielsen ratings, and we all know how accurate those wonderful things are, aren't we? Before we go any further, there's one other thing I want to mention, too, and that's to give credit to the director of this episode, whose name I wrote down. Marvin Rush. Now, I have talked in the past, and we'll actually do a whole video about this in the future, about the idea of one person getting too much credit for something that a lot of people worked on. But it is worth noting that one of the reasons the directors tend to receive such extensive credit is because they tend to deserve it. And this is a wonderful example of that. Marvin Rush, in this example, took an, an episode and actually did some more or less on-the-fly rewrites to it, uh, polishing out a lot of scenes, fixing a lot of the presentation of some of the ideas, even adding a few things in, like the idea that fear is not always necessarily a bad thing, as per Catherine Janeway's letter speech. And I mention that because this script was also written by the gentleman who did Cathexis. You probably remember that episode. I wish I didn't remember that episode. So it makes a lot of sense when you realize that the director had a huge hand in sculpting this episode into what we ended up receiving. Now, before we go further, this is not a commentary or a negative, it's just, it's just something I wanted to share. As I mentioned back in Death Wish, they had several clips that they had recorded uh, and edited and basically had ready to go that they then didn't have room to put into Death Wish because Death Wish ran so far over budget on the time. So one of the things they did was they would, you know, piece and parcel the, the clips they could use in other episodes in places where it made sense, which again, I applaud. This episode is a good example that right at the beginning, there's a scene with Harry and Tom as the two are talking and there's this whole clarinet thing. That was actually recorded for Death Wish, the whole thing, including the come to the bridge thing, because that's when they were going to find out about the comet. <laughs> But while I am commenting on the, the usage of that and the good idea, I have to add that the very usage of a scene that is literally generically Lego, that can just be slotted in wherever without change or, or any alteration to the overall fabric, well, let's just say that that is a problem Voyager has and will continue to have, and I will talk about far more when we get to an episode called Equinox. I know I've mentioned it before. Just bear with me. But before I go on, I do want to mention that once again, and this has been true since the first episode, it's just nice to see the chemistry between both Tom and Harry. And, and that's really all I wanted to say. I just wanted to give some props to it. The two actors still managed to do something with a scene that is basically just fluff, but at least it's enjoyable fluff. So, props there. Now, a couple thoughts about the setup for the situation. First, the fact that only 400,000 people lived on this trading outpost, which used to be a fairly decent trading hub within the region. Okay, that's actually pretty cool. I'm with that. Now, you might think a planet with a population of 400,000, or even a moon, is, we don't actually know, but either way, a large, a, a body in the heavens having a population of only 400,000 is kind of pathetic. 
if you think about it, I mean, the city I live in right now, I believe, has a higher population than that. But that's my point. It's just a trading outpost. And how many people do you think would live in a place like that, And at least unless it became an actual booming societal place? So I just wanted to give some level of props that rather than being 3.2 billion or whatever, which might have been more accurate for a planetary population, they showed that they were paying attention, is my point. Too often Voyager will not pay attention and get little details incongruent, which just shows how little effort they're actually putting into making it work. So I wanted to give some credit for them for actually doing it properly here. One other thing that's kind of, eh, is they have a throwaway line about how these people had some kind of a solar flare which devastated them and blah blah blah, and that they could not escape due to atmospheric interference. Now, I don't want to talk about this too much, but a couple things. First of all, I, I, I know a lot of you out there already know this, because most Star Trek fans are also, in some fashion or other, science geeks, but solar flares don't actually do that much. Really, when it comes down to it. I mean, they can cause disturbances and problems and that and not, but devastating a world to the point where it has to be depopulated for 14 years? Really? But I'll let that go. There are ways to explain that. Okay. I'm just mentioning it because science fiction writers tend to use the term solar flare as this doom thing a lot when, well, kind of isn't, <laughs> you know? But I'll let it go because it can be explained. But the fact that they can't escape from this, an obvious trading hub, uh, which obviously has knowledge of interstellar uh, species and travel and what like that, that's also a bit iffy. I'm still willing to let it go. I'm only mentioning it because these two things basically had to exist for the sake of this story, right? And on the f for surface of it, both of these things are kind of silly and stupid, okay? But... I am mentioning it because this is one of those things I like about uh, good works, whether it be you know television or movies or games or books or whatever. It's that the more I think about it, the more I enjoy it. I've talked about this a lot. And believe it or not, I actually spent a decent amount of time thinking about this. Because you guys know me, I'm kind of a setting kind of a guy. That, that's if, if I had one strength when it came to writing, it would be building a setting, building a backdrop. And so when I think about this situation, when I think about the history that might have led to this, I come up with a situation where we have these people who actually are planet-bound. Because, now of course, this is a trading outpost, so we know for a fact they have the ability to travel through interstellar space. Okay. However, what we do not know is how expensive or costly or difficult or time-consuming it is for them to do so. After all, not everyone has access to warp drives. In fact, we saw that a few times in TNG, for example. So maybe these people were literally just a colony ship that came here to settle, and, you know, it by instance, by happenstance, it happened to be in an in a, uh, area frequented by actual people who do have interstellar travel, who have warp drive and whatnot. And so they kind of set themselves up as a trading hub. Now, obviously, they don't have a space station that's actually mentioned, or rather inferred, I should say, because it's all pla uh, groundbound. But they could still, you know, host people here and become a trading hub without having the ability to actually go to other planets themselves. So, okay, I'm with that. Okay, that makes sense. But then the solar flare comes, and you know what? We're just going to ignore that. And something is happening, and something is causing this situation where, okay, we're worried, and we have to bear ourselves. What do we... How do we explain how the ways of this, this situation came out? And if you think about it, the idea that... Maybe one of the, the these people had no idea how to deal with the situation. No concept, no understanding, no technological innovation of how to proceed with surviving this catastrophe. But one of the last traders to call when they were nearing, you know, when they were aware of the coming crisis but had not had a solution to it, sold them this technology, this interface, this thing that builds this interactive, semi-sentient uh, artificial program that keeps them in stasis and then they could bury themselves beneath the earth to survive that. Makes sense, doesn't it? Also explains why they have something that is actually really, really advanced when you think about it. The ability to scan and alter uh, and understand and comprehend uh, the brainwaves of different species, I might add. And then actually live, dynamically interact with that and produce new results based on that. That's incredibly advanced technology. But it would make sense that they would just buy this thing from someone rather than they made it themselves. And that was just kind of their last-ditch effort of, okay, screw it. You know, whatever, we'll take this. Because after all, and this is also important, 
purchasing space for 400,000 people is actually a little harder to do than it sounds. The Enterprise D, which was a colossus as far as Star Trek ship sizes go, only had room, I think, at absolute maximum. I forget the, you know what, I forget the number. I'm not going to make it up. It was like 3,000-something if, if they actually were crammed to capacity. They mention it in the technical manuals, and I have them over there, and I'm not going to pull them out just for this. But you get my point. That's a drop in the bucket for 400,000 colonists. Think about how many galaxy-class ships it would take to evacuate this planet. Now, there are other ways around that, but you get my point. A dedicated fleet of people whose only job is evacuating these people could have pulled it off. A trading hub who are basically cut off from other resources other than the people who come to call in order to trade makes perfect sense that they wouldn't be able to escape. There we go. You, you, uh, now, I'm sorry for extrapolating this so much, but that's my point. I like things that, when I think about them and make me think about them, I enjoy them more. It fleshes it out more. It also explains one of the reasons why things evolved the way they did. Forgive me for kind of giving things away a bit early here, because I'm about to talk about the mystery aspect of the episode, but it makes sense for why fear became such an important and catastrophic event within the lives of these people, if you think about it. Why wouldn't it? It's this brand new alien technology they just bought, and their world's about to end in blank time, and they have no idea what to do, so whatever, let's just do it! There's going to be tons of uncertainty, tons of fear, tons of worry about that situation. It is absolutely no surprise, then, given those circumstances, that that is exactly what would have happened. Now, there's one other thing that bothers me, and that's the fact that on this planet of 400,000 people, there were five survivors. Well, two. <laughs> but you get my point. Five? However, if you think about it, it would make a lot more sense if what actually happened was they found one of the, you know, hidden stasis cube uh, places or whatever, and there were many, many, many more of them. I can't credit the episode this, because the episode just kind of assumes that you're supposed to assume that these five people were the only survivors of a city-sized population of an entire planetoid, which is silly. But... It makes a lot of sense if you consider it from the perspective that this was just the first one they found. And so they beam it up, go through the episode's events, figure out how to defeat the system, which they can now replicate relatively easily, I might add, especially going in knowing now. Now they don't have to lose any hostages. Now they can just walk in and say, hey, and, you know, negotiate, wake it out, work, blah, 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 bam, and get all those people out and ready. Because otherwise, I'm sorry for being blunt, but... What's the point of being the only five survivors of an entire colony, right? And yet here's where the other thing comes in again. Because again, the more I think about it, the more I can come up with a reason that makes sense. It's not the reason I would prefer if I was writing this. But think about this. Think about that trader I mentioned earlier that came by with this brand new technology. Well, imagine if A, these people didn't have the ability to replicate it, and B, he only had one unit for sale. Imagine the kind of chaos and upheaval that happened for these people as they struggled and, and tried, and people were probably injured or possibly killed or worse in the efforts to obtain this, this miracle technology that some people probably don't even know how it works or what it does. They just know it can save them. And think about these five people being the ones who succeeded in getting it working and succeeded in getting it buried below while all their friends and family and other comrades up above died in the flare. Think about that and then add that fear aspect to it again. And tell me that just doesn't make your spine tingle. So again, even though I could pick apart this episode, the more I think about it, the more the pieces kind of slide into place themselves. And given the general level of quality that went into this episode, I think that was on purpose. One of the other things I want to definitely give props to this episode is its development of the mystery. The way they present it, they get through it really quickly. The pacing is really excellent in this episode. It really is. The entire episode up to a crucial point, which I'll be talking about later, is basically one long, continuous upscale. The entire episode starts low with the little clarinet scene, and then it, we find this planet, and they're all dead, and we found this, and we've got this, and here's this thing, and here we da, 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 and it just builds and builds and builds and builds the whole episode up to that one crucial point. And so as the mystery is building, there's never a point where this episode just pauses. And it does that on purpose. You never act... If you, if you, 
you have to use pauses in a story deliberately and with purpose. You have to do it with an intent in mind. You know, I want you to think about this. I want you to examine this. I want you to be in shock about this. You know, for whatever purpose, you have to have a reason to have a genuine pause in the overall action pace tone of a story. But this one doesn't. It never lets you actually stop. And that's what's brilliant about it. Because the whole point is that's what fear does to a person in real life. The greatest way I have discovered to defeat strong emotions in life, anger, fear, uh, those are pretty much the two big ones, <laughs> is to pause. That ability is so hard. Anybody out there who's been through traumatic, horrible circumstances knows exactly what I mean by how difficult it is to do it, and yet it is so successful when you pull it off. Because the moment you pause, it just deflates. Fear and anger both are self-sustaining. But when you cut them off from themselves, they just shrink. They're just like a flan in a cupboard. <laughs> And that's my point. This episode replicates that feeling. And, oh my god, you know, I'm just going to skip ahead to it. I'm just going to skip ahead to it. Because that pause thing fits brilliantly because that's exactly what happens in this episode. The whole episode, they don't let you pause. They don't let you stop. They just build and build and build and build. And we learn more and more and more about the situation and the events and the, and the terror and the horror. And, oh my god, and then there's, oh my god, and Harry's going to die. And then this is going to happen. Oh no, but now we're trapped. And now we can't get out. Oh god, and now we're going to terrify Harry. And then... Everything goes dead still. The music stops. The, the director makes everyone in the entire scene stop moving except for the two principal characters. Uh, three, actually, excuse me. The actual camera, which at, until this point had been doing this kind of a thing. It's not, not weaving, not bobbing, don't mistake me. But the camera was in a continuous state of motion for a huge portion leading up to this moment. And then the camera stops, the music stops, the people stops. And there's Picardo playing the doctor, picking up, excuse me, you're holding that scalpel wrong. And that's where we introduce that pause in real life, in a meta sense, to make it so the audience can also catch their breath, just like the characters in the show can. Brilliantly done. I, I have to applaud, because that was just amazingly done. Forgive me for gushing. But holy crap. Okay, now let's rewind a bit. I'm on, like, point two here. Um... One of the things this episode did really, really well was the idea of using the... Uh, I don't have a good way to put this. The 60s silliness of Trek in a new light. Because, I'm sorry, but a lot of people, myself included, probably thought this when we first saw that, that set. You know, the garish lighting and the really outlandish costumes and lots of pastel colors. It's just like something out of the old Trek. Now, don't mistake that for an insult. But you do, if you do something like that, you have to do it deliberately. You have to do it with a reason, with a purpose. Early TNG made the mistake of doing that several times just because it was emulating the original series. And that didn't work out so well. But in this episode, they do it deliberately, specifically to throw you into that kind of emotional state, into that contrast, so that everything is just kind of garish and wild and weird. And it's like, okay, whatever, and oh my god, what's happening? Oh my god, they're going to chop off my head! You know without any real change in the tone or in the presentation. If you watch it, I, I, I know this is going to sound weird, but watch the intro scene there. Not, not the intro scene of the episode, but like when they discover fear, when he first shows up, up until the, the cut where they're taking him up to the guillotine, watch that scene with the sound muted, and you'll see exactly what I mean. The whole scene, nothing actually changes in their performance, in their presentation, in the way they move. It just remains, it's all part of the show. It's all part of the circus, and we're just kind of doing our thing. And nothing changes at any moment from between we're dancing with you to we're going to chop off your head. And it works really well to showcase it, it with, with one little thing, with one little additive of perspective and... Um, Context, that's what I want. With one little added bit of context, this garish, horrible, you know, show turns into a nightmare. Brilliantly done. I also, I, I have to give a billion thanks to Michael McKean's performance as, uh, he, his, his official character is referred to as the clown. I'm going to be referring to him as Fear from henceforth. They even call him Fear in, in the episode. Fear's ability to portray 
Oh my god, it's so incredible. He does such a wonderful job that I, I cannot applaud it enough. He gives the perfect balance of total emotional instability and yet very strong emotional output. At no point in time is he ever calm or relaxed. At all points, with, with one exception, at all points throughout the episode, he is constantly outputting emotion in some manner or another. He is constantly portraying it. And he flips back and forth between, you know, being in charge and being terrified. And it's wonderful performance because I can't describe it like, you know, so many people call some, a performance of a crazy person the Joker nowadays, right? Or a Kafka, which I, I postulate is actually different from Joker, but whatever. You know, this is not really a portrayal of a crazy person. He is literally portraying the emotion of fear and everything that is so unstable about that. For example, and there's wonderful little touches. I only wrote down, um, I only wrote down one right here because I realized very quickly I'd be writing down like 20 or so. But there's a lot of little touches. Pay attention to his tone and his expression as he's doing this episode. For example, when uh, he's about to chop off uh, Bellana or Harry's head, I think it was Harry, uh, in, in the guillotine, the guy sets a stop, comes up and says, Stop! He's an interstellar Trevor. You know, if you, if you kill him, they'll know and they'll shut down the program. Watch McKean's performance. He's not like, Oh, you're right. Or, Oh, I guess. Or, you know, anything like that. No, he, he immediately goes and, Let him go. He's just immediately, because he himself is just seizes up. You know what I mean by that kind of fear? The, you know, the, oh, Let him go. Let him go. I need to do something right now. You know, that whole instinctual fear thing going in there. And then later on he tries to pretend like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm in charge, I'm in charge. He does that several times in the episode. He doesn't say I'm in charge, but that's what he means. That is what he is presenting. And yet that itself is also an aspect of fear. Not just the fear of not being in charge, but the relief that comes when fear itself is perceived to have faded. And, of course, the hidden layer behind that when we know that fear, that the source of that fear, excuse me, has not actually gone away. And so we try so hard to hide it, to push away what is causing us to be so afraid. You know, yes, we've won. We've won. There's no need to be afraid. You know, I, I, I can't even put into words how wonderful his performance is. Excuse me for, for rambling on, but my goodness. Speaking of which... <laughs> The performance of the side characters is also amazing. And I did a little reading up on it, and it's some, it, a lot of things came together when I read up this. Did you know that the side performers, the, the background circus artists, whatever, those are actually members of the Cirque du Soleil. Or were at the time, or however you want to think of that. That's actually who they brought in for this. Which explains a lot, because not only are they very well choreographed, especially for Star Trek, but they have a wonderful stage presence. They get across the same aspects of fear as much as anyone else does. You see tiny little things in their performance, like the actual uh, the executioner himself, who savors the moment as he's about to execute someone. Why? Oh, because he's feeding off of the fear of the person who's about to do it. Why hesitate? Why hesitate if you're trying to kill him? Well, because killing him isn't the point. Not really. Even when it's later, when it's an emergency situation, and they're about to be shut down, he still pauses to savor the moment. Why? Because that's the whole point of his existence, is to absorb, to feed, to enjoy that fear that is emanating off the person that knows he is about to die. It's not about the killing. It's not about the events of the killing. It's not about why you're doing it. It's not even about your own existence. It's just about feeding off of that. There are, one, there are dozens upon dozens of little examples of that, just tiny little subtleties throughout the episode of their performance. And one of the other things they do really well is they take their cues from McKean's perfectly. Like, they, they will, you know, you know, he, like, for, okay, I'll give you the most obvious example, and then you could use this to watch the other ones. There's a scene where he actually goes, <laughs> and every, the, 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 the line, uh, actually, excuse me, the stack of people behind him all laugh with him, and then he goes, Hunk, and they all, in, in almost near total unison, Hunk, and go right back to their serious faces as if nothing changed at all. They really got across the, across the performance that they were just an extension of him very well. So, definite kudos. Um, <laughs> uh, hang on a second. Oh, yeah, lots... Okay, I mentioned the director. Let's give director more credit. Yes, really. A lot of little touches were done in this episode to emphasize the unreality of the situation. Every now and again, there'd be a shot where the background would be moving. And I mean, actually, like, the background would be moving. And it's, they accomplish it very well because what they do is they move the camera just a little bit while the stage itself 
he is actually being shoved to the side, that kind of a thing, with a set, excuse me. And uh, they would do things where, like, stuff would just kind of flourish in. They would do a camera pan over here, and during the blur... Well, see, forgive me for kind of giving this away, but, like, for example, let's say this is the camera. And I'm recording you right here. And the scene cut is recording you to be over there. So I'm going to do this, and then do this, and then I'm going to cut, right? And then you're going to move over there. I'm going to move the camera back to here. I'm going to do the same thing, and then now you're over there. And when you splice those two together, it, it works really well because whoonk, it's the same motion, it's the same thing, and it just it's really simple little touches like that. Old, what I like to call old, stool, old school, old style tricks as far as directing and camera work. Another good one is there's a scene where he's, he's explaining to Harry and Bellana that he is now built up from them, too. And then he turns, and there's just all of a sudden there's this giant oversized comm badge on him. And it's one take. There's no cutaways. It's just him, and, and you see him from the front. And then he rotates around like this. And I can't do the whole rotation because the size of my chair, but bear with me. So he's rotating around like this, and then when he comes back, there's the comm badge here. But if you pay attention to the camera angle, it's up. It, it kind of focuses in first on their faces and then on the back of his so that when he so that there's a, 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 a grip can rush up here, and, and 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 really as he's turning really quickly pin this thing to him, and everyone has to not look at him as he's doing this and run away. And then he comes back, and now the pecan badge is there. It's a lot of little touches like that that really add to the unreality of the situation, and just generally give a better performance of the whole piece. So, holy crap, you know, <laughs> really well done. Um, oh yeah, so this is. This is the pause moment that I was building up to earlier. If you pay attention during the scene where everything is getting worse and worse, as he starts going after Harry, that, that's where it really starts to get bad. Everything up until that moment in the entire episode has been, as I mentioned, one continuous build of adrenaline, of pitch, of tone, of pace, and it's, and it's building and building, and it gets to the part where, you know, Harry is down there, and fear is hitting him exactly where he needs to. He is hammering him, and McCain, McKean's performance is terrifying in, in how brutally to the point it is. He doesn't try to hit Harry with distant fears or, or quiet terrors or anything like that. No, no, he smashes him right in the face, just like a technically-minded person like Harry should be hit. And as he's doing it, there's no, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. And, and all the background performers, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Come on, repeat it, repeat it. You know, just... <laughs> And it's building and building, and if you pay attention to the music, the music actually starts to get a little discordant, and some of the notes start to go off, and whoever's performing it, either they edited it after the fact, or when they made this piece, they actually had the performers literally, you know, screw up intentionally on parts of the song, so the song gets more and more screwed up until it reaches that fever pitch where he's about to cut into Harry, and that's when the pause happens. Music stops, camera stops, actors stop, the doctor pulls up and says, excuse me. And that brings me to my next point. You know, I've been doing nothing but gushing this whole episode. I'm sorry. Secretly, I'm not that sorry. It's nice to actually be excited about a Voyager episode. But, um... Uh, Robert Picardo and uh, Michael McKean's have actually worked together in the past. And it kind of shows... Whenever you, could, whenever you see two actors, especially stage actors or theater actors like that, working together, it's kind of obvious that they have had some kind of work experience. Because they just flow right back and forth between each other. Oh my god, the, the back and forth between the Doctor, who is just portraying the Doctor, no, not that Doctor, and McKean's, who's portraying Fear, and it's funny because McKean's keeps trying to build the, t the tension back up. Literally, every line for that first encounter is, huh? utter deflation, because there's nothing there for the Doctor. The Doctor probably does, well, let's not mince words, the Doctor does experience Fear, but it doesn't affect fear himself at all, and the Doctor cannot be touched by fear, and he knows that. And so it's build up, nope, build up, nope. <laughs> and it's no wonder that afterwards fear was in such a bad mood. You remember afterwards he's like, hmm, he's moping. I've had some people ask, why is he like that? Because the one and only thing fear could do, building and arousing fear in others, he failed at repeatedly over and over against the Doctor, and it, it was something he had literally never experienced before in his life. Ironically, it was the unknown to fear. Um, let's go ahead and rush through the rest of this really quick, because I've been gushing way too long here. First of all, I want to say the fact that there was no third solution, no magical way out. I like that. It's something that Star Trek doesn't do uh, as often as I would like. I hate to say that, but it's true. Too many times, especially on Voyager, they find some magical solution to, you know, 
find find a third option, make it so they can work it. In this case, this is a true dilemma. Either he dies or the hostages die. So they choose him die. So they actively are trying to defeat, to destroy fear. Okay, I'm with that. I like that. Um, I also want to talk about one of the other brave choices they made in the episode. Usually, when you're doing a television show, the budget is so important. Both time and money budgets are basically your dominating things. They, they absolutely dominate every other aspect of what you're doing on a show. I hate to say that because it's really cynical and horrible, but it is true. So, with some noticeable, noticeable or notable, excuse me, exceptions. That being said, if you have a guest star who has speaking lines, uh, and I'm not talking about McKean's, that character is someone you generally want to be more important and have more face time because you've already paid a, a chunk of the budget on that guest star, and therefore you want to get them your mileage out of them, right? Makes sense. Now, the irony of this is this actually explains something you see a lot in television, especially in Star Trek. The one guy happens to be the face for the entire planet syndrome. There are a lot of examples in those, even in modern Trek. Well, calling Enterprise as modern as God. Where we would always talk to one guy, and he would be the one face for all our interactions with this planet. And occasionally there would be a couple other thugs, but there would be one guy talking. It's, it's, it's an aspect of that. So when you have the one guy that we're talking to, whose name I can't even remember off the top of my head right now, having him killed in the episode was actually a very brave choice, all things considered. Now, granted, it was towards the end of the episode. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But nevertheless, when I saw that, I was impressed that they actually were willing to do that because that just kind of subverts expectations and it really drove home the seriousness of the situation and, of course, it spoke to Fear's irrationality, both the emotion and the character. After all, killing hostages just makes your situation worse when you come down to it. But let's, let's go ahead and talk about that other thing I just referenced just now. One of the things I really like about Thaw, and this is true with good uh, television and good movies in, in general, I've noticed, personally, me. It's generally a good episode or show or movie or whatever if I don't realize it's almost over. If the time is just passing so entertainingly, if I can use kind of an improper term there, that by the time I, I, I think to look at the thing, I'm like, oh, it's almost, it's almost like only five minutes left of the episode or whatever, you know? Which is exactly what happened there. I didn't even realize I was like 40, um, excuse me, 37, I believe it was, minutes into the episode, into a 42-minute episode. I was like, oh, oh, well, I guess it's almost over then. That's usually, at least in my experience, the sign of something that is good, something that is high quality, something I'm enjoying. Because let's just say that when I watch an episode like, oh, I don't know, Threshold or Innocence or Shades of Grey, it gets to the point where I, I look at the clock I look back to the episode. I look at the clock, and it's been like two minutes. I look back at the episode. I haven't written anything down in four minutes. Look back at the clock. Back at the episode. You get my point. Now, I have decided not to talk about hostage situations in general, so we're just going to skip that discussion. There's a lot that can be said about that, and it's one of those volatile situations that in my blunt opinion, should never exist in an ideal world, so that's pretty much all I have to say about it. A hostage situation is lose-lose for everyone involved pretty much all the time. And, yeah, the end. Moving on. The Doctor does something wonderful right towards the end here. He does what I like to call the shock, the rush, and the hook, okay? This is something I myself have done a few times in real life when it's been an emergent situation. It's something that you do when you really want to make someone make a decision. And you generally want them to be slanted in a, a particular way of making the decision. And you want it done right now. Here's what you do. First, you shock them. And in the doctor's case, it was the ultimatum. Let them all go. Period. Or she's shutting it down. And, and you notice Fear's response was, yeah, right. And then that's, but see, the thing is, whenever you hit someone with shock, the most logical and, mo excuse me, logical, the most predictable response, forgive me for quoting Matrix, but this is true, the most predictable response the person is going to give is denial. Yeah, right, whatever. That's when you implement the rush. In the doctor's case, he did this wonderfully. He said, you have one minute to decide until we shut this down. Yeah, right, whatever. And then every time the doctor spoke again, he said what second they were at in the conversation. Now, I actually meant to, to get a watch and watch just to see how close they were. Even if they weren't actually to the second, it was pretty close. So definite props for trying. But the point gets across even if it wasn't to the second accurate. 
You have 60 seconds to decide, or we'll kill you. No, my, yeah, right, you're gonna do that. You now have 52 seconds to decide. Also, we want them all gone immediately, or else it's going to be shut down. No, no, this, this can't be happening. I need more time. You now have 48 seconds, you know, and you just constantly remind them of that ticking clock. The doctor just hammers him in the best way to hammer something like fear without any emotion at all. Just flat, blank wall. You now have 30 seconds to decide. And then he hits him with the hook. And that's what actually sinks it to. Until that point, fear was panicking. And a panicked person, especially in a hostage situation, is bad. But that's when he hit him with the hook. There's one proviso. You will get Captain Janeway entirely. The hook is exactly what it sounds like. Here's the bait. Here's something you want. And in this situation, when you are already shocked, when I am willing to do something horrible to you, and you have only a few seconds to decide, if you do it, this good thing will happen. It forces the brain to enter a different mode of thinking, and it reaches the point where the person is more willing to accept this, even if it is a net negative for themselves, because... You see? The shock, the rush, and the hook. It's a terrible thing. Don't ever do that in real life. Um, but the way he presents it is absolutely brilliant. And then he gets to the point, he says, time is up. What is your decision? And, and fear just says, yes, of course. Because ah. what else can he do? I mentioned at the beginning of this video that there are many different types of fear. Many different aspects, many different qualities, many different flavors, sh shadings, whatever you want to call it, that comprise fear. But there is one thing that defines all of them. And that is the fact that fear exists to be defeated. Fear exists to be conquered, to stop, to cease, to reach the point where the source of fear is no more. In many ways, it is very similar to pain. And I hate myself for saying that, speaking as someone who's been in pain most of his life, but it is true. The point of pain is to make it so that you are aware of what is causing it and then to stop it so that the pain goes away. Pain is self-defeating in its purpose, just like fear is. All forms of fear. And that is the true irony and the great aspect. Again, props to the director. He did a little bit of rewriting to make this happen this way. The point of fear in this episode is that fear itself, even though he denies it, even though he is in, it, at first he is in a panic and then he's, he's just petulant and then it reaches the point where he reaches the worst form of fear of all. Quiet, despairing horror. When all he can think about is the fact that he is about to end. And as the lights fade on a blank soundstage and it gets to the point where you can, can't even see his eyes anymore. And he whispers in one of his final words, I'm afraid. And that's how the episode ends. He whispers that, and Janeway gives her chilling line. And then it all goes to black. And then the credits roll. It would have been so easy and so expected to tack on a coda at the end of that, to have the crew talk about all oh, they've learned about fear. It would have destroyed any of the dramatic potential of that scene, but instead they end it right there, in the faded darkness that was fear.